Beside the Brook, the story of someone who found the truth, written by Catherine MacDonald. Beside the Brook, the story of someone who found the truth, Written by Catherine MacDonald and published by the Christadelphian office in Birmingham, England. This is really a children's story, but like most children's stories, it is written in a way that parents would really enjoy reading it. And I think there is much benefit for, for uh, older brethren and sisters to read this book which ends, by the way, in a very emotional way, which I think you will appreciate. The story is set in the New Forest in England. There was a very early ecclesia there, which met in the forest under a very large tree. Later, of course, there was an ecclesial hall, which is still there. So, beside the brook, chapter 1, A House on Wheels. The brook was nearly dry because of the summer drought. It only dried up once or so a year, for it flowed from a bog between hills in the new forest where the ground was spongy at all times. Thousands of red sundews sparkled all ready to catch flies in that swamp, along with asphodel, bog myrtle and bog cotton. But the brook left all those behind and trickled through the heather until it came to the woods of oak and hazel trees. Sometimes it passed beneath dark tunnels of rhododendron, then out again between meadows and through parks, where aspen trees quivered on the stillest days, and pigeons cooed in the thickets of the lime trees. The brook supplied several farms, and what a number of creatures rejoiced in it! Two timber-cart horses took turns bathing in a deep hole they had made in its bed after the day's work was done. Troops of velvet-eared calves paddled about during the hot noon and were joined by their mothers, the dairy cows, when milking time was over. True, the sheep did not enjoy being pushed in at cheering time, but felt all the better when they climbed out, scattering drops like rain. The brook was the only world that mattered to, to the ducks. They dribbled, waddled, fished, and quacked in it all day. There was only one thing they could not do. They could not dive, because it was not deep enough. Being a gravel brook, it chattered in a shallow way between pools that rarely measured more than three feet deep. Of course, water rats, coot, and other wild things shared the brook as well, and rabbits took the short cuts across it where the stones were near the surface. Two other happy little beings rejoiced in the brook and chattered nearly as much. They were Peggy Broom, aged ten, and her brother John, two years younger. They spent much time by the brook, which ran only a shorter distance from the cottage where they lived. All they had to do to reach it was to cross the timber yard, enter the wood where the sawdust was tipped, and there they were. But hornets were busy chewing touchwood in an elm, old elm tree growing there, so that Peggy and John chose to go down to the water where the cows drank. That was in the meadow. Two dangling iron fences across the brook stopped the cows from getting into the woods and the children love swinging on these while looking down into the current. Just beyond one iron fence a wooden bridge spanned the brook. Here the banks were steep and fringed with bluebells in May, and tall hemlock which, in July, met from both sides and made a feathery roof over the water. Peggy and John did not often paddle because the gravel hurt to their feet, and there were prickles in the sandy bits. But they arranged and rearranged the big stones, making fords to get across. 
They stood on the stones, holding jam pots ready for the queer little whiskered fish to pop in. They leaned over the banks and poked about for caddises and freshwater shrimps. They measured the cavities under the banks with long sticks and bent over the deepest parts to see if they could find a salmon trout. Occasionally one lurked about in the pools. Peggy once caught one when the brook had stopped flowing and only the pools were left. She chased it round and round and after a long while flipped it up onto the bank where it jumped about so much that it jumped back into the pool again. This August day, after tea, the children wandered down the drying brook towards Mr. Wilmot's farm in search of wasps' nests. Father's plums, pears and apples were all being sucked by wasps, and he had promised that they should stay up and accompany him and the creosote can when he went down at sundown to put a stop to the capers of the wasps, if they found any. "'Look, John,' whispered Peggy as they approached the spot where the stars of Bethlehem drew. "'What?' says John, whose mind and eyes were fixed on the possibility of adders in the fern. "'Over there,' said Peggy, pointing to the bank ahead where the mushroom meadow came down to the water. "'That hen house wasn't there last night?' "'Is it a hen-house?' asked John. "'It's got wheels and shafts. "'And isn't that a little ladder leading up in front?' "'Both children stood and stared. "'The funny tar-painted hen-house had a little window at the side "'and a long tin chimney-pot with a bend in it "'coming from under the eaves. "'Somebody must live there,' whispered Peggy in John's ears. Chickens don't have window curtains or chimney pots. And look, there's a TTT painted by the window. And there's a fireplace outside, said John excitedly. Four bricks were arranged over an opening in the ground thick with wood ash, and an iron tripod with a hook stood over it. Whoever can it be? Peggy asked her imagination busy with witches, tramps and gypsies. "'Let's go away,' said John, who preferred to solve the mischief at a safer distance. But they did not go very far. The brook was between them and the queer house, so they only got through the barbed wire enclosing the wood and sat under an elm in the park from where they could see if anyone came out or went in. The cows cropped their way right across the mushroom meadow and back again before anything happened. The children were just beginning to wonder if anything would happen when they saw some feet beside the ladder. Breathless, they listened. A door opened and they heard steps inside the house. The little window was opened and fixed to its catch and they just caught sight of a brown face and a mop of white hair before the curtain fell into place again. "'It's an old man,' Peggy and John said together. They were so used to having this part of the world to themselves that the thought staggered them. John looked a bit frightened. A fear crept over him that perhaps henceforth Peggy and he might not be allowed to come to this part of the brook. Perhaps TTT stands for his name, suggested Peggy. Let's guess it. T for Teddy, she added. And his other names might be Ting Tong, said John. Yes, said Peggy. Teddy Ting Tong. The newcomer sounded less fearsome with a name like that, and they settled down more comfortably to await developments. Presently Teddy Ting Tong came out with a kettle and hung it on the iron hook above the fireplace. Then he stuffed a handful of dry bracken underneath, struck a match, and added some fur cones. Cool, said John, whose fervour rose with the flames of Teddy Ting Tong's fire. How oh, lovely! They wished they were closer. Next, Teddy got a frying pan, peeled and sliced some onions into it, and stood it on the bricks. The kettle had apparently boiled, for now he was busy with the teapot. Placing a square of galvanised iron over the bricks, 
Teddy next began to fry the onions. He can't be so bad, said John, whose nose caught pleasant whiffs now and again. The old man was too far off to allow the children to see much of him, and when the onions were cooked he went indoors with the teapot and frying pan, and they saw him no more. They had completely forgotten about the wasps' nests, and so confused their mother when they got home with telling her about Teddy Ting-Tong and his strange home, that she thought this was a new kind of game they had thought of. Chapter 2 Meeting Mr Ting-Tong during the next few days, Peggy and John spent a good deal of time spying on Teddy Ting-Tong, being careful that he should not see them. Their lookout post was the elm tree, whose trunk was so huge at the bottom that it looked like four trunks joined together, the openings between the roots making four cosy triangular compartments. A short stretch of grass thick with yellow bed straw and harebells separated them from the wood, and as the branches of the tall acacia trees just inside the fence were all too high up, they could see the interesting henhouse home on the other side of the brook. He chose a good place to put his house, observed Peggy, because it isn't at all windy there, and the bank of the brook isn't very steep. I suppose he gets all his water from the brook, remarked John. Yes, that's what the bucket's for. The new bucket hung from a hook below the house. Look, he's got a clothesline today, exclaimed John. He's been washing his socks and hankies. I wonder if he's at home. It was Monday afternoon, and there was no sign of the old man. Most of Sunday his house had been quiet, and the children had concluded that he had gone out for the day. They themselves had been to church, and had not played by the brook lest they should spoil their best clothes. "'I wonder why he's come to live here at all,' said Peggy. "'And I wonder where he came from,' added John. As they spoke, they saw Teddy Ting Kong come slowly along Drove, a grassy track bordered with brambles leading to Mr Wilmot's meadows. "'Perhaps he's coming home from work,' said John. "'Perhaps he works for Mr Wilmot,' echoed Peggy. They soon guessed they were right, for instead of Teddy Ting-Tong returning straight to his funny house, he went over the brick bridge, lower down the brook, through the farmyard to the dairy, and soon reappeared with a little can of milk. "'He can't be a tramp or a gypsy, then,' said Peggy decidedly, or Mr. Wilmot wouldn't allow him near the dairy. For some time they watched and listened for the strange old man busy in his house, and it was only because they heard their mother calling them to come and fetch their milk that they rose to go. I know, said John. Let's follow him tomorrow and see where he goes. That's a good idea, agreed Peggy, so long as we're ready to start when he does. But they were not ready next day to start off behind Teddy Ting-Tong, who rose at half-past six and was gone for the day an hour later, with lunch and dinner packed in a big straw bag strapped to his shoulders. He looked rather top-heavy with that, and a very bulky overcoat, green with age, surmounting two thin legs encased in corduroys and gaiters. The children had thought nine o'clock soon enough to start to the venture, but on arrival across the brook at a safe distance from Teddy Ting-Tong's dwelling, they discovered it silent and deserted. "'He's gone,' said John. "'Let's go up the drove,' said Peggy. "'He came from that way yesterday.' So they set off. Nets of spiders' webs festooned the bramble bushes. John, determined to enjoy himself, bent a green stalk round into a loop and scooped up the webs with it like a spoon, and soon had a pretty little plaything. Peggy ate blackberries and collected thistledown to stuff a pincushion for Mother's birthday in September. Meanwhile they kept a lookout in the fields each side for any sign of Teddy Ting-Tong. 
In one field, wheat stood up in tidy stooks, waiting to be carted. Rabbits could be seen bobbing round them, and pigeons were busy picking up fallen grain. Pheasants from the woods were searching too, between the rows of stubble their long tails trailing behind them. In one field the cows were snuffling and cropping the dewy grass. They would be turned into another field after milking time. As the children drew near the gate at the end of drove where the big cover started, they could see a wide grassy field with hurdles at the other end. In the winter a great part of this field was covered with shallow water, and once, when Peggy had seen the surface ripples caused by the wind, she had named it the Pacific Ocean, and the name had remained. "'I do believe there are some sheep at the other end of Pacific Ocean,' said John. "'There aren't usually any hurdles there. Let's go and see.' Peggy was just as keen as her brother to find out about the sheep. Mr. Wilmot did not always keep sheep, because his was largely a dairy farm. Recently, however, he had been growing turnips, and now he had decided to feed sheep upon them so that his fields would be enriched by manure. As the children drew near the hurdles, they could hear the noises made by the flock, Low bleatings, patterings, shufflings and pushing. The flock seemed to be crowding at one end of the enclosure, though the turnips were everywhere. Each sheep seemed anxious to push its nose into another one's wool. They looked so funny with their yellow eyes blinking from black faces that they made the children laugh. The sheep seemed to laugh too, for their queer mouths turned up at the corners, and they sometimes wagged to their heads and flapped to their ears as much as to say, that really was a good joke. So eagerly were Peggy and John watching the flock that they did not at first notice a figure bent over a sheep in the distant corner. Only when the figure straightened up and the sheep ran off to join the flock did they see it. There's Teddy Ting Tong, they cried together. Yes, indeed, there he was, and he had heard them. Now he was coming towards them. Their first idea was to run away, and John turned to go off, but Peggy grasped him by the arm. Wait, John, she whispered, I think he's all right. We're outside the hurdles and he's in, so we needn't mind. Poor John still felt scared as Teddy Ting Tong approached and even Peggy had to pull herself together and pretend she wasn't frightened. Was he cross with them for disturbing the sheep? There was still time to run away. But when a kindly voice says, Good morning, little ones. Stay and see my bairns. They were immensely relieved and glad they had stuck their ground. Good morning, replied Peggy, while John's face broke into a wide smile. Do you look after the sheep? Yes, said the old man. I'm a shepherd, though there's not enough sheep here to keep me busy all the day. I'm helping with the harvest as well, and doing one thing and another on the farm. John was glad to be assured at last that Teddy Ting Tong was neither tramp nor gypsy. At close quarters the man's face was pleasant. Small, bright brown eyes twinkled from beneath rather hairy eyebrows. He had no whiskers on his brown face, and there were laughing lines at the corner of his eyes and mouth. In fact, Mr. Ting Tong looked as though he had never been cross in his life, and he could never have smoked a pipe, for the few teeth he had, four at the top and three at the bottom, were straight and white in spite of his apparent seventy years. His clothes were rather patchy and baggy, but his shirt was clean and his hat was interesting, being of soft tweed and no particular mould, with a partridge's and a jay's feather stuck in the band. "'See my barons,' said the shepherd. "'You what?' asked Peggy. "'My barons, my sheep,' Teddy Ting Tong repeated. "'That's a funny name to call them,' said John. "'Why, you burns yourselves. 
laughed Teddy. "'Aren't you, your mother's bairns? "'Children, I suppose, you call yourselves. "'Well, children's are bairns in the country where I came from, "'and these sheep are mine.' By this time the sheep had crowded round Teddy Ting-Tong's knees, the hindmost pushing their heads between those in front until he was surrounded by a fidgety mass of woolly bodies. "'They know me now,' chuckled the shepherd, fonding the nearest ones behind their ears. Though this time last week they had not left Salisbury Market. "'You love your sheep, don't you?' said Peggy. "'Have you always been a shepherd?' Teddy Ting Tong raised his head and looked away to the furthest treetops, as if something Peggy had said had roused a far off memory. Aye, he answered. I've always been a shepherd. The land I came from was a land of hills and sheep. This is neither, but I'm happy to have just a few sheep and a wee hoose beside the brook he added as an afterthought. The children perked up at the mention of the house. "'I like your house,' said John. "'Did you bring it with you?' "'Yes,' said Teddy. "'At least Farmer Wilmot's horse brought it. "'It's the only hoose I've had for a while, "'and I thank God for it.' "'Are you going to stay here?' asked Peggy. "'For a while, maybe,' replied Teddy Ting-Tong. That is, as long as he has sheep. So you've seen my wee house, he asked. Yes, admitted Peggy honestly. We've been watching it off and on since we first saw it. Only we were afraid to come too near. The old man laughed. You need not be afraid of me, he said. You can come and be guests in it, come to tea, but ask your parents first. As the shepherd spoke, he was looking over the sheep one by one, examining each fleece for prickles or ticks which might irritate. "'Oh, thank you, Mr. Ting-Tong!' replied, cried Peggy and John. The old man looked up and laughed. "'Mr. Ting-Tong, who's that?' Peggy turned red while John said, "'That's you! "'You know you have your initials, "'printed in white by your window. "'Oh, I see,' he said. "'That's right. "'I'm Mr. Ting-Tong. "'What's my first name?' "'Teddy,' replied John, "'while Peggy was silent. "'We made it up,' she said, "'rather shamefacedly. "'Never mind, never mind,' said the shepherd. "'It will do. "'Come and tell me tonight "'when your mother says you may have tea with me. Now I must fix up the heralds in another place. I mustn't spend my master's time talking, even to some good little bairns. Goodbye, goodbye, Mr. Ting-Tong, said the children, pleased to run off and discuss in private this wonderful invitation to tea in a hen-house. <laughs>